Good morning and welcome to Tacoa First United Methodist. We are delighted to have this time together. We rejoice in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are thankful for this day. It is indeed the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great gift of life that you've given us. Not just regular life, Lord, but by your power, we can walk in abundant life and relationship with you. Thank you for that great gift, Lord. We lift up your name. We declare that you are mighty. You are holy. You are present with us, Lord. What a privilege to know your Holy Spirit, to hear you guiding us, Lord, and directing our paths. We come to you this morning with a joyful heart, but we also have things that weigh upon us. There are people we know that need your healing touch. We ask that you heal them now. There are people who need to know your peace. Send your spirit of peace now. There are people hurting. Lord, there is chaos. We need your calmness. We need the reminder that you are Lord of all. We thank you for your presence. Lord, we thank you that by your power, regardless of what's before us and around us, we can know your peace, your joy. It is from that place of calm that we pray together the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again
Our scripture reading for today is from Exodus 17, verses 1 through 7. Hear now the word of the Lord. And we know that it was written long ago, but it is for us today. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord. And they camped at Raphadim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. 
And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Harab, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah, because the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I was talking with an older gentleman in a church that I once served. He lived with his granddaughter and her young family. He was sort of like the Uncle Charlie of the family in My Three Sons, if you remember that show. He helped to cook and clean and carpool the kids around. One day he was complaining about kids these days and how different they are from the good old days, you know, when he was younger. He said one time, back in my day in the summer, we'd go outside with our friends first thing in the morning, we'd hop on our bikes and our parents probably wouldn't see us until dinner time that evening. And they didn't have, and they didn't have to worry about us and they didn't have to give us bottles of water to take with us. Heck, if we got thirsty, we would just go in someone's yard and turn the garden hose on and, and drink from the hose. And even though I was much younger than this man, I remember drinking from a garden hose. Everyone who's tried it knows that water from a garden hose on a hot summer day is really the best tasting water of all. The last time I bought a garden hose, I noticed a tag on it that read, safe to drink from this hose. And I thought, you mean there are hoses that aren't safe to drink? water from? Because we didn't give it a second thought back when we were kids. My point is, toxic garden hoses notwithstanding, we Americans have a luxury that the vast majority of people in the world today, not to mention in the history of the world, don't have. We, we turn on our faucets in our houses or we turn on the spigots outside and out comes fresh, clean, potable, safe to drink water, as much as we want, and it's relatively cheap. To say the least, the people of Israel in today's scripture did not enjoy this luxury. They are thirsty, and they want Moses to know just how thirsty they are. Verse 3, but the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Listen, I'm not minimizing the Israelites' need for water. You can survive for weeks without eating food, but you can only last a few days or less without water. I'm not making light of their crisis. It's just that if you read the previous two chapters of Exodus, you'll see that grumbling against Moses in the face of a crisis has become a recurring theme. In chapter 15, a few days after crossing the Red Sea out of Egypt, the people came to a stream called Mara. They were thirsty, but they couldn't drink the water there because it was bitter. So what do they do? They grumbled against Moses. Moses prayed, God intervened, and voila, fresh water for everyone. In chapter 16, the people are hungry. In fact, they're so hungry, they're hangry. So they grumbled against Moses. Moses prayed, God intervened, and voila, God sent quail for them to eat in the evening, 
And the next morning, and all the mornings to come, uh, there was something that they'd never seen before. It was manna. It was some kind of miraculous bread from heaven. It was this white, flaky stuff, fine as frost on the ground, Scripture says. It tasted like wafers made with honey. It was perfectly nutritious, and they could eat their fill of it and be satisfied. For the next 40 years, God miraculously fed the people of Israel with this manna. With this in mind, doesn't it seem crazy, if not downright stupid, that their first response to this latest crisis, a lack of water, is to blame and accuse Moses, and ultimately to blame and accuse God, of leading them into the wilderness to die. That's what they do, though. I remember as a five- or six-year-old kid uh, trying to learn how to swim. I was never very good at it, and I didn't learn until I was an adult. But my dad tried to teach me, and he would take me out into the part of the pool where my feet could not touch the bottom. And as I, as I clung for dear life to the side of the pool, dad would walk several yards away from me, you know, in that part of the pool where I couldn't touch the bottom. And he beckoned me to swim out to him into his waiting arms, into his safe and strong arms. But I was so worried that I would drown between the side of the pool and where he was standing. And I really didn't trust Dad to keep me safe, to take care of me. And he knew that. And he said to me one time, Brent, if I didn't love you and want to keep you safe, you would have been dead a long time ago. I didn't know what he meant at the time, but I do now. In so many words, he was saying, haven't I proven that you can trust me? I've kept you alive this long. What makes you think I'm going to stop now? What makes you think I'm going to let you drown now? Trust me. In the same way, hadn't God proven himself trustworthy to the Israelites? God did not miraculously lead them out of slavery in Egypt, miraculously lead them through the wilderness with a, with a column of smoke and fire, miraculously lead them across the Red Sea while the water welled up on each side of them like two walls, miraculously release the water and drown Pharaoh and his threatening army, miraculously purify a stream of bitter water for them to drink, miraculously feed them in the evening with quail, miraculously feed them in the morning with bread from heaven, only to bring them now to this place called Rephidim, where he would now let them die of thirst. Like I said, it's crazy or at least stupid to think that way. And yet, here we are. If the Israelites had learned the lessons of chapter 15 and 16, instead of grumbling to Moses and believing that he and God were going to let them die, they should have said to themselves something like this. It's true that this riverbed at Rephidim is dry. It's true that we're thirsty and we need to drink. It's true that based on these circumstances from a worldly point of view, our situation seems pretty hopeless. But you know what? God is unimpressed and unintimidated and undaunted and undeterred by measly things like circumstances. After all, we were trapped at one point with the Egyptian army on one side and the deep Red Sea on the other. There was no way out of this hopeless circumstance. There was no way out of these circumstances, but there was one way through them, and God brought us through them. He brought us through the Red Sea. He made a way for us, and it was glorious. So obviously, God will do something like that again. In fact, I wonder what miraculous thing God will do for us this time. 
I can't wait to find out how God is going to glorify himself and rescue us from these circumstances this time. I can't wait to see what God is going to do. Well, that's what the Israelites should have said if they had learned the lessons of the previous few chapters, but they didn't learn those lessons. But guess what? God is patient with them, and God loves them enough to teach them to trust in him. And that's why God has put them in this situation. That's why he's testing them, to teach his beloved people, slowly but surely, to trust in him. Because God knows that grumbling, like most instances of anger in our lives, is a sure sign that we are not trusting in God. And maybe, maybe the Israelites would deny what I'm saying at that time. They might say, what does God have to do with this? We're not mad at God. We're mad at Moses. He's the one that got us into this mess in the first place. I mean, and sure enough, look at verse 2. They said to Moses, give us water to drink. As if, as if Moses were hiding some secret stash of water somewhere and, and uh, he's unwilling to share it with them. What kind of question is that? Then in verse 3, why did you bring us up out of Egypt? And there's so much irony here because we know things that the Israelites don't know. We know that rescuing Israel from slavery and leading them to the promised land was most assuredly not Moses' idea. <laughs> On the contrary, look at chapters 3 and 4. Moses tried to tell God in a dozen different ways that he was not the right man for the job. He tried to talk God out of his plan. Moses did not want to do this. So it's no wonder that Moses points the Israelites to the one who is ultimately responsible for the situation they're in. He says in verse 2, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? In other words, he's saying, your problem is not with me. You think it's with me. It's not with me. It's with God. You're grumbling against me, but I'm not the one you should be angry with. God is the one who's responsible for all this. God is the one who brought you here. If you're going to be angry with someone, at least have enough faith to be angry with God. Because at least if you're angry with God, you'll be angry with the one who's in a position to do something about it. <laughs> There's a lesson here for us. Every time you grumble, every time you complain, every time you get angry, turn your grumbling and complaining and anger into a prayer. Because at least you'll be directing your grumbling and complaining and anger in the right direction. In the direction of the one who has the power to actually do something about it. Even if God chooses not to change the circumstances in response to your prayer, let God give you whatever grace or insight or patience or peace that you need to handle these circumstances. And don't stop praying until God does that for you. 20 years ago, when I was still an angry young man myself, um, I saw a fantastic and deeply Christian movie called The Apostle. It starred Robert Duvall. It's not a kid's movie by any stretch. I think it was rated PG-13. But at its heart is a strong gospel message. In the movie, Duvall plays a successful, energetic, Pentecostal preacher named Sonny who gets into a lot of trouble. I mean, his, his wife cheats on him. He loses the megachurch that he's pastoring in Texas. And well, other bad stuff happens 
most of which is his own fault, at one point he has moved in to live with his mother, played by um, June Carter Cash. And one night, in the middle of the night, we see Sonny pacing the floor of his bedroom with his hands up in the air like this, shouting at the ceiling. Turns out he's praying. And here is some of what he says. Somebody, I say somebody, has taken my wife. They've stolen my church. That's the temple I built for you. I'm going to yell at you because I'm mad at you. I can't take it. Give me a sign or something. Blow this pain out of me. Give it to me tonight, Lord God, Jehovah. If you won't give me back my wife, give me peace. Give it to me. Give it to me. Give me peace. Give me peace. I don't know who's been fooling with me. You or the devil. I don't know, but I'm confused. I'm mad. I love you, Lord. I love you, but I'm mad at you. I'm mad at you. Ever since I was a little boy and you brought me back from the dead, I'm your servant. What should I do? Tell me. I've always called you Jesus. You've always called me Sonny. What should I do, Jesus? This is Sonny talking now. And as he's pacing the floor and shouting at the Lord, in the middle of the night, the phone rings. His mother's in bed asleep, but she answers the phone. And it's a neighbor it sounds like you have a wild man over there. Are you okay? Is that your son? And Sonny's mother says, that's my son. Ever since he was a little boy, he either talks to the Lord or he yells at the Lord. And tonight, well, he just happens to be yelling. Notice the people of Israel don't even have enough faith to yell at the Lord. They don't think the Lord is going to do anything about it. So they just go and yell at Moses instead. Does, does that require any kind of faith to yell at Moses? No, because he's standing right in front of them. Well, I'm a lot like the people of Israel. I wish I had learned all of those years ago something that Pastor Sonny in the movie understood. If you're going to be angry, be angry with God. <laughs> Tell him about it. Turn your anger into a prayer. God can take it. He knows that you don't like this situation that you're in. But as Pastor Sonny understood, since ultimately God puts you in this situation in the first place, it must be part of his plan for you. Listen, if he had a plan for his people 3,500 years ago with Moses in the wilderness... He has no less of a plan for his people today. And if you're in Christ, you are a part of God's people. And, and God has a plan for you. And God is working that plan through everything that's happening in your life. And when I say that you are a part of God's people and God has a plan for you and God's working that plan, you might be thinking, who, me? I'm a nobody. Who am I that God should have a plan for little old me and my life? Listen, don't you believe it? Let me share one of the most astonishing promises from the Bible. It comes from 1 Corinthians. The church to which Paul was writing was badly divided over a number of issues. Among other things, the church was split into factions based on which apostle was their favorite. Some said, I belong to Paul. He's the best. He's my guy. Others said, forget about Paul. I belong to Apollos. He's the best preacher. And still others said, well, I belong to Jesus's numero uno disciple, to Peter himself. And Paul here refers to Peter by his Aramaic name, Cephas. But listen to Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 21 to 23, and prepare to be blown away by them. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. In other words, here these church members are arguing over which apostle they belong to. And Paul says, you don't get it. 
The point is not that you belong to me or Apollos or Peter. The point is we all belong to you. Because our Heavenly Father, in His sovereignty, is enabling us to serve you and your best interests always. In fact, Paul says, this is true of literally everything in the universe. Our Father is ensuring that everything in the universe is custom-tailored for your benefit. You may not be able to see it right now, but everything that happens to you, everything that will happen to you in the future, even your own death, it's all for your good. And it's all for God's glory. And it's all working out perfectly according to God's plan for you. Which isn't to say, by the way, that God's plan for you won't involve at times a great deal of pain and suffering. Do you remember the rich young ruler in the Gospels? Um, a rich young man wants to be a disciple of Jesus, but Jesus tells him that he must first go and sell all of his possessions and give the revenue to the poor. And of course, this man is unwilling to do that, so he walks away dejected. Because as much as he loves and respects and looks up to Jesus, well, he loves his money and possessions even more. And Jesus knows this about him. Anyway, I want to leave you with these words from C.S. Lewis, who reflects on the rich young ruler in his book, God in the dock. He writes, Christ said it was difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven, referring no doubt to riches in the ordinary sense. But I think it really covers riches in every sense, good fortune, health, popularity, and all the things one wants to have. All these things tend to make you feel independent of God, because if you have them, you are happy already and contented in this life. You don't want to turn away to anything more, and so you try to rest in a shadowy happiness as if it could last forever. But God wants to give you real and eternal happiness. Consequently, he may have to take all these riches away from you. If he doesn't, you will go on relying on them. It sounds cruel, doesn't it? I'm beginning to find out that what people call the cruel doctrines are really the kindest ones in the long run. I used to think it was a cruel doctrine to say that troubles and sorrows were punishments. We might say today, discipline. But I find in practice that when you are in trouble, the moment you regard it as a punishment or discipline, it becomes easier to bear. If you think of this world as a place intended simply for your happiness, you find it quite intolerable. Think of it as a place of training and correction, and it's not so bad. <laughs> not so bad. That's classic English understatement. If through the pain and suffering, if through God's discipline of his children, we get to experience more of Jesus, more of his presence, more of his love, more of his grace, more of his power, than what God is doing for us in this world, including all the hard stuff. Well, it really is the greatest thing that can happen to us. The question is, will we trust him even through the hard stuff? Almighty God, we pray right now that you would give us the faith to believe that no matter what happens to us, good, bad, or indifferent, that we uh, know, uh, we believe and we know that you are working your plan in our life and that your plan for us is for our ultimate good. It's for our lasting happiness and joy, and of course, 
It is for your glory. And, and we want to enjoy your glory, God. And uh, so we pray that you would give us the faith to turn our anger, our bitterness, our complaining, our grumbling into a prayer to you, that we could bring it to you in prayer and that you could heal us of our anger and that will enable us to trust in you more and more. We don't want to be angry at you, God. And of course, we pray that that's a short, you know, experience that we have and that, and that you'll, you'll heal us of those things that make us angry and that you will um, help us to find joy um, in and through every experience in life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I met a man who walked on water Who wore his crown like a blue collar I met a man who treated children Like they were ambassadors to the kingdom If I saw the world in your eyes Would it help me understand How you see through all our lies Still you hold us in your hand I'm trying to believe I'm trying just to show That we're less than perfect More than flesh and bone People climbing trees Catch sight of you Broken and blind Searching for the truth We're crippled by Our fears and torments Oh, son